in the dust of the rabbi, which is the series topic uh, throughout our summer months. And I trust that you have been inspired, encouraged, challenged to open the scripture to the red letters. In many ways, the Sermon on the Mount, this opportunity where Jesus takes uh, his disciples on a mountainside and he says, and he draws a picture for them. This is what a follower of Christ looks like. And he talks about an array of topics which we're covering throughout the summer. And today, uh, the topic is Jesus and fasting. Uh, Jesus and fasting. You see, if you read the life of Jesus, you will soon find that on many occasions, Jesus would pray and he would fast. In fact, before he began his ministry, he spent 40 days and 40 nights in the desert, praying and fasting, committing his life to the Father, asking the Father for direction and strength and sustenance because he knew he needed the Father's help to accomplish the will of the Father. And so I think if there is a spiritual discipline in our day that so many times is unheard of or neglected or misunderstood, It's this discipline of fasting, this discipline that says, I will take this item, maybe social media, maybe my iPad, maybe the foods that I eat. I will put that on the back burner for today so that I can consecrate, so that I can focus my full attention in prayer to my father. I think it's one of those disciplines that's really critical in our day because or culture and society tells us that we need to crave over certain things. Did you know that large companies and organizations, one of the latest hires or the latest roles in organizations are crave consultants? Have you heard of this? Crave consultant. I don't know if you can get a degree in craving, but... Companies such as Pepsi and Kraft and Cadbury Chocolate, they hire Crave consultants that help these companies and businesses come up with products that you and I would crave for. In fact, did you know one of the most craved after snack food is Cheetos? Mmm, Cheetos. You know why? You know, here's a Crave Consultant's perspective on Cheetos. They say this, Cheetos are one of the most marvelously constructed foods on the planet in terms of pleasure. Marvelously constructed snack food, Cheetos. It'll fulfill all your cravings. Do you know why it's rated as one of the top snack foods? Because as the Crave consultant goes on, he says, because it has a vanishing caloric pleasure. What is he saying? Vanishing caloric pleasure? He says, because Cheetos melt in your mouth, our minds think there's less calories in them. So, hey, eat the whole bag. And so... Let's face it, our world and the whole marketing arena of our society tries to make us believe that without this product or without this item, your life is incomplete. You are unfulfilled. you got to have it. Well, fasting comes against the cravings that our culture tells us we have to have. The discipline of fasting actually helps us understand, wait a minute, I can say no to that and yes to Jesus. Because man does not live on bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. My prayer is that we would have cravings for more of God, so much so that there are moments in our lives where we will fast foods, we will fast Uh, social media. We will fast whatever it is that the Lord is asking us to fast so that we can focus undividedly our tension to Jesus, who ultimately is the one who truly fulfills us, 
who is the one who truly sustains us, who's the one who truly nurtures us, who the one who actually is the answer to the cravings of the deep recesses of our hearts. In fact, fasting in many ways is feasting on Jesus. Fasting is feasting on Jesus. I mean, here are a few passages of, 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 of Scripture. John 6, 48 to 51, Jesus says these words. He says, I am the bread of life. Your forefathers ate the manna in the desert, yet they died. But here is the bread that comes down from heaven, which a man may eat and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he or she will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. What's Jesus saying? He's saying, I have come to give you that spiritual nurturing that you need. Don't be deceived to think that everything the world has to offer will fulfill the void in your heart. What truly fulfills the human heart is to feast on the bread of life, to feast on Jesus on a daily basis. And fasting enables us to say, I don't need this. I don't need that. I can use self-control and simply feast on Jesus because at the end of the day, he is all that I need because he's manna from heaven. He is the bread of life. He fulfills every desire of my heart. The bread of life. So when we fast, we're feasting on Jesus. Deuteronomy 8.3 says this, He humbled you, causing you to hunger, and then feeding you with manna, which neither you nor your fathers had known, to teach you that man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. In fact, this passage, Jesus requotes. In Matthew chapter 4, when he's being tempted in his 40 days and 40 nights of prayer and fasting, the evil one comes to him and says, Jesus, I know you're hungry and I know you're more than able and you're powerful. So why don't you turn these stones into bread and eat because you're hungry? Go for it. And Jesus says to the evil one, actually, what sustains me is the words that come from the Lord. For man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. You see, friend, are you getting hunger pains for the things of God? Do you ever get, just as maybe now your stomach is growling because lunch is around the corner, is there moments where spiritually there are these hunger pains for more of God in your life? where you desire so much to open his word and eat at the table of the Lord? Because ultimately, friend, he is the bread of life. Nothing that the world has to offer will ever fulfill, truly fulfill the, 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 the emptiness of our hearts, but only Jesus. And so here's Jesus. It's, he's understanding that he needs to hear of the words of his father. Of course, we see it also in John 4, 34. Jesus is speaking to his disciples, and he says, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. What is Jesus saying here? He's saying, My fuel, what gets me up in the morning and what keeps me up late at night, what sustains me, what fulfills me, what nurtures me, is to do the will of my Father. And so what fasting uh, does for us is it enables us to be reminded that I am to be sustained by God every day. I need his strength. I need his wisdom. I need his guidance. And so when we go without certain things, when we choose to go out, uh, go, go without caffeine for a while or go without, God forbid that. When we go without social media or without those electronic devices, without those video games for a while or without foods or, or choice foods or desserts, whatever the case might be, we're indicating to God, God, all those things, as great as they are, nothing is greater than you. I want to taste you. I want to experience you. 
I want an appetite in me for more of you in my life. And so, God, I discipline myself and I say no to that and yes to you. Now, if we're feasting on Jesus, if, if fasting is feasting on Jesus, then while we are in this fasting season, we should be joyful. We should be grateful. We should be uh, just, in many ways, fulfilled because we're feasting on Jesus. But that's where the Pharisees and the religious leaders got it wrong, didn't they? You see, they were fasting, but they did it for the wrong motives. They did it for the human applause. They did it so others would say, wow, they're spiritual. They're worthy to be listened to. Look at them. They're giving up food for a while so that they can pray. But their motives wasn't to actually feast on Jesus. Their motives was for power, for reputation, for human applause rather than the divine nod of approval. And so... When Jesus speaks to them in Matthew 6, 16 to 18, he says, When you fast, do not look somber as the hypocrites do, for they disfigure their faces to show others their fasting. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. They've gotten the human applause. But when you fast, put oil on your head, put gel, put hairspray, Comb your hair like mine. I came back from vacation and somebody came up to me and says, Pastor, you lost more hair. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> but when you fast, put oil on your head. Wash your face so that it will not be obvious to others that you're fasting, but only to your father who is unseen and your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And so when we make these sacrifices of fasting, we, we don't do it for the human applause. We don't do it for the wrong motives, but we do it because we want to feast on Jesus because we want more of him in my life because I want the same hunger pains as sometimes I get about other things in life. I want them for Jesus. I want them for Jesus. So you might sit here and say, well, why should I fast? Give me some good reasons. Because to give up food for a day, I mean, or to give up my iPad or my iPhone, I mean, I can't live without those. Dessert, caffeine, what? Well, here's some reasons why I believe fasting can put us in an environment where God can transform our lives. Number one. To seek God's guidance. The reason why we fast is to seek God's guidance. In fact, an example of this is found in Judges chapter 20. The people of God, they're, they're going through all kinds of battles and they keep losing. In fact, they think they had lost three consecutive battles in a row. They had lost literally thousands and thousands of men in battle. And look what they did in their time of great need. It says, then the Israelites, all the people went up to Bethel. And there they sat weeping before the Lord. They fasted that day until evening. And they presented burnt offerings and fellowship offerings to the Lord. And the Israelites inquired of the Lord. You see, they turned to fasting. They went without food for a day because they were saying, God, you're our sustainer. You're the answer to our situation. We need your guidance. What do we do? We're getting killed. And the Lord began to speak to them as they inquired of the Lord through prayer and fasting. And he directed them to their next step. And because they had done that, God had granted them favor. Another example of fasting and searching for guidance, it's found in the New Testament in Acts 14, 23. It says that Paul and Barnabas, they appointed elders for these churches, for them in each church with prayer and with fasting. They committed them to the Lord in whom they had put their trust. You see, Paul and Barnabas, as they were being used by the Lord to plant churches throughout the land, they realized that leadership was going to be important. 
But they didn't just pick names out of a hat. They said, Lord, we're going to consecrate some time in prayer and fasting so that we're inquiring of you for guidance on who to put where and when and where and how and who's equipped and who's called by God to do this. And so why do we fast? Because we need God's guidance. So you're sitting here today and maybe there's some situations, some circumstances in your life where you need God's guidance. Maybe you're a student here. You're about to embark in a whole new school year, whether you're in high school or whether you're going to university or college. Wouldn't it be a great idea to maybe set aside some time of fasting before you embark on this next school year to say, God, I'm going to need your guidance. As I sit in that classroom and hear professors tell me a lot of things, I'm going to need your mind. I'm going to need your wisdom and deciphering what is true, what isn't true. And Lord, I'm going to commit some time of prayer and fasting because I need your direction. Maybe there's a parent here today and you're going through some challenges with your kids. And maybe God is calling you to, to sacrifice something so that you can focus on prayer and fasting, so that God can direct you to give you wisdom on how to raise that child or, or how to navigate through that difficult situation. Maybe it's your marriage. You're going through a rough patch and it's difficult and you're wondering, are we going to make it through this? And maybe God's saying, why don't you guys sacrifice something? And spend that time in prayer. And I will use that season to direct you. Friends, as a church, as we embark in the fall season, an historical fall season that it will be, we would be amiss if we're not saying, God, we need your voice. We need your direction. Yes, you've got pastors and you've got leaders that that have been trained and educated. But friends... We're mere men. We need the Lord's guidance to lead us through. And so September 8, 10, 12, we're going to say as a church family, God, direct us. God, we need your guidance. We need your wisdom. And so we're going to pray and we're going to fast. We're going to say no to certain things so we can focus on that. And so that's why we fast for seeking God's guidance. Number two, another reason is to express concern for the work of God, to express concern for the work of God. One of my favorite Old Testament leaders is Nehemiah. Nehemiah was a great man who who the Lord used to do great things, to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem, which laid in ruins for 150 years. And and, and this, this great city has now been desolated, and the people of God are discouraged, and they've been neglected. And And for 150 years, all kinds of leaders walked back and forth from this wall. But nobody did anything except one day, God began to speak to Nehemiah. He had heard the bad report that the walls had been laid barren and the people were discouraged. And watch what happens to this young leader, Nehemiah. The scriptures say that when I heard these things, Nehemiah says, I sat down and I wept. For some days I mourned and I fasted and I prayed before the God of heaven. You see, before he even began to launch into a vision, he went to his God and said, God, this is a huge deal. This is a huge project. I mean, there's a reason why nobody's done anything for 150 years. There's huge opposition This is going to take massive amounts of work. God, I need you. Lord, are you calling me to do something about this? He prayed and he fasted because he had a concern in his heart. Now, you need to understand that Nehemiah was not a prophet. He wasn't a pastor. He wasn't a priest. He was just an ordinary guy. He was a lay person. But God began to speak into his heart. And he came out of that prayer and fasting with a vision that God had placed on his heart to rebuild the wall of Jerusalem. And as the story goes, he rallied the troops with the help of God. And every family took their portion of the wall and their responsibility. And together they went through opposition. 
The opposition said, what good can, what kind of wall can the Israelites build? A fox will crawl on it and it'll crumble. It's not going to work. You guys aren't able to do this big part. It's been 150 years. What makes you think you're going to be able to do this now? They tried to be violent against them and the workers had to carry swords. They tried to distract Nehemiah and get him out of, out of Jerusalem into the plains of Oh no, oh no. A few weeks ago, many of us were on our God-given property on Tompkins Road, and we were cleaning it up, and we were cleaning the weeds. In fact, September 20th, I believe, is going to be round two. So meet me at Tompkins Road, and we'll continue the work to be done. But at the end of the day, uh, a couple Saturdays ago, most people had left, and I, it was, I was still there. There's a few others. And, and I remember as I was going back to my car, I stopped, and I looked back onto the property that the Lord has blessed us with. And I got to tell you, it was a moment of excitement and vision, but at the same time, I felt the weight of responsibility too. And I remember whispering to myself, oh God, what a privilege it is to build the house of God in our city. Lord, may you fill this house one day with people that are so far from you. May you fill this house with children that so desperately need a family to belong to. Teenagers with a school right next door, I thought, may those teenagers find Jesus here. With a Tim Hortons on the other side, may every caffeine drinker crave for God. And you know what's cool about this journey that we're on? You, you, you. I get phone calls, text messages, uh, telling me, Pastor, I just want you to know we went to the property with our kids and we prayed. We had our kids praying that God would give them an opportunity to be part of building the house of God. Some of you text me early in the morning. I've gotten texts saying, Pastor, I just spent time in prayer for our church and I am so filled with faith that God's going to provide all of our needs. As we do that together, friend, as we say, as we pray and as we fast, <laughs> because we realize the magnitude of this thing, that God will bless that. Because this is not about one man or any man or any woman. It is about him and him alone and his house. And so we fast to express concern for the work of God. Number three, we also fast to learn the disciplined life so we can be prepared to overcome temptation. You see, if our world teaches us you need this, you need that, you need to crave this, and, and your life's not really complete with that, it gets us in this undisciplined mode where whatever comes our way, we eat it, or we do it, or we buy it. And fasting brings us to a place where actually I don't need to eat that, and I don't need to buy that, for me to experience fulfillment because I do not live on bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. And so when we fast, we learn to balance our life. In fact, fasting helps ensure we have a balanced life. That's why Paul in 1 Corinthians six twelve says, everything is permissible for me, but not everything is beneficial. Everything's permissible for me, but I will not be mastered by anything. Do you ever catch yourself saying, if I ever lost this, I don't know what I would do with my life. I can't do anything without this. Maybe those are the things that at times we need to put in the night table for a while to prove to ourselves, wait a minute, I don't depend on that. I depend on him. I need him to make it through my day, not some electronic item. Not necessarily those chosen foods, but I need him today. Number four reason why we fast is this, to reveal the things that control us. See, something happens when we fast. Some, something powerful happens. And as I was preparing this talk, I, I needed to, to say that I'm warning you. 
that if you choose to fast, and there's a whole booklet there in your bulletin to give you even more information about this spiritual discipline of fasting. But as you fast, what happens is things in your heart will begin to surface. Things that are not pleasing to the Lord, things that maybe have been buried in your heart, they surface. You know why? Because God wants to transform your life. Spiritual discipline in itself won't transform you. God transforms you. What a spiritual discipline like fasting does is it puts you in a place, in an environment where God can come and transform you. So when we fast and we're feasting on Jesus and, 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 and we're making him the number one priority, it opens our life up and God shines his floodlight in our hearts and he surfaces things that need to go. So that means if there's anger in our hearts or if there's some bitterness there or some jealousy or some strife or fear, if they're within us, they will surface during fasting. It kind of reminds me of a beach near Perrinport, Cornwall in Great Britain. You may have heard of this beach, and there's a, an image on the screen. It's unlike any other stretch of coast in the world. But it's not known for its breakers or its sand, but for what actually washes up on the surf. You see, if you went to this beach, there are tens of thousands of toy Lego bricks that come to shore. I think, I told my son this, he's like, Dad, we need to go to that beach. <laughs> like, can you imagine all the Legos we can get from there? Next family trip is in Great Britain. But you see, a shipping container filled with millions of Lego pieces went under the waves off the coast in 1997. And the brightly colored plastic building toys Fittingly, many of them nautical or pirate-themed have been washing up on the shores of this beach ever since. Oceanographers uh, believe that there's a lesson to be learned here. They say this, the most profound lesson I've learned from the Lego story is that things that go to the bottom of the sea don't always stay there. The incident is a perfect example of how even when Inside a steel container, sunken items don't stay sunken. They can be carried around the world, seemingly randomly, but subject to the planet's currents and tides. It's a principle that extends to spiritual life, isn't it? What seems sunken far into the deep of our hearts is rarely truly gone, is it? And what happens when we fast and we feast on Jesus, those items that have lurked beneath the waterline surface. And here's the beautiful moment. God not only surfaces those things in our hearts, but then he is faithful to forgive. Then he is faithful to restore. He's faithful to heal. He's faithful to strengthen. But when we don't have these spiritual disciplines on our lives, these things stay buried in our hearts for years and years to come. So why do you fast? So that those things that maybe have been below the waterline for many years, that they can be dealt with. So that you can meet Jesus, the restorer, the redeemer of our lives. That's why we fast. And finally, this morning, we fast to express simple, sheer devotion to God. We fast, yes, because we want guidance. Yes, because we want to learn discipline. Yes, because out of concern for the work of the Lord. But sometimes we fast because we just want to feast on Jesus. Because out of sheer devotion for God, God, there's nothing I wouldn't do for you. I can say no to that and I can say no to that so that I can focus on you because I live by every word that comes from your mouth. And one of my favorite ladies in the New Testament, her name is Anna, Luke 2, talks about her and says this, she had lived with her husband seven years after her marriage. So she, she got married, she, she was living with her husband for seven years and then he died. 
and then was a widow until she was 84 years old. Listen to what she did with the rest of her life. She never left the temple, but worshiped night and day, fasting and praying. Wow. Anna was a woman who, the apple of her eye, everything about her life, what truly sustained her was, was Jesus. Jesus, I don't even want to leave your temple. I want to fast and pray to the day I die because there's nothing that gives me more pleasure than to worship you, than to pray to you, than to listen to you. Anna. And so sometimes we fast just because we love Jesus, just because we want more of him in our life, just because he's our sustainer, he's our healer, he's our Messiah, he's our great rabbi. I'd like to call up the worship team at this time. I want to conclude with this quote from a missionary. Her name is Amy Carmichael. She's an Irish, she was an Irish missionary to India. She said these words. She said, certain it is that the reason there is so much shallow living, and she describes shallow living like this, much talk but little obedience. So she's saying, the reason why there's a lot of shallow living, which is a lot of talk but not obedience in our life, is that so few are prepared to be like the pine on the hilltop, alone in the wind for God. I don't know about you, but have you ever felt like a pine on a hilltop all by yourself? Sometimes as a follower of Jesus, you're going to feel that way. You're going to, you might feel that way in your university or in college or high school. You might feel like that sometimes in your employment. It's going to happen because the world will tell us you need to crave and do all this. And there'll be moments where you'll say, actually, no, I don't. <laughs> what I need is Jesus. <laughs> Sometimes you might feel like this with your family. You're like the only tree. But boy, is that a beautiful place to be, isn't it, at times? When the wind of God blows through your heart. And in that time of dedication and prayer and fasting, God comes and he refreshes and he rejuvenates and he fulfills the true craving of our souls. And you sup with him and you commune with him. There's nothing like it. Intimacy with God. There is nothing like it on this side of heaven. And so assuredly, there'll be times when we'll fast things. We'll go without them so that we can focus on Him.